Hi everybody, welcome to Creature Feature. Thanks to T-Mobile and Ford for sponsoring our season and sponsoring and uh, being able to bring you these live videos. This is Jane Ann Franklin and this is Cunnick. We're gonna be talking about polar bears, the North American iconic species. Don't forget to send us your questions, put them in the comment box. I'll feed them to Jane Ann and I'm gonna turn it over to Jane Ann now. Hi everybody. Well, here we are with Cunnick who is now nine years old, hard to believe. She came to us from the North Slope of Alaska. Um, and was just a little 60, 70 pound cub when she moved here to Louisville. And now she's at about 500 pounds. Right now she has, she has blown off all of her winter coat and she's starting to grow in a new one. So she looks like she's had a little bit of a haircut. It's kind of short right now and it'll, it'll get longer as the season progresses and as winter comes along. Polar bears are different than other types of bears because they have an elongated neck. Their jawline is slimmer and slender, and they can reach in ice holes and pull out the seals that they're hunting. Whereas other bears, brown bears, grizzly bears, black bears, have blockier jaws. And if they were to grab something through a hole, they would get their head stuck and not be able to pull out whatever that was they were trying to hunt. And polar bears do eat the blubber of the seals. They eat um, ring seals, mostly. But as of right now, because of the loss of sea ice, bears are having a shorter period of time to eat that, that fat off those seals, and it's impacting their body condition and the survivability of cubs on a, on a fairly extensive basis. And Cunnick's story is that she was abandoned or orphaned on the north slope of Alaska, and she is actually named after the Cunnick oil field. And Cunnick is, uh, means snowflake in Inuit language. And luckily, um, the Conoco oil folks saw her, reported her fish and wildlife. They came and took a look, could not find her mother and her sibling. And so then she disappeared while they were looking for her mom and her sibling. And four days later, she showed up again. And so then it was made, the determination was made to bring her into captivity, especially after they found her mom and her sibling out on the sea ice hunting and didn't want to try to reunite them then. So she's a true ambassador. For, for her species and for those, for those bears from up north and off the Alaskan slope. If you take a good look at Cuddick, you can see how dark her nose is and that, but the skin around her eyes. Her skin is black and her hair is made like honeycombs so that it can filter the, the sunlight down to her skin and warm her up and she'll keep all of the heat in. So yeah, polar bears, they may look white and their hair actually is hollow. It's kind of like a clear straw. If you put a bunch of them together, it'd look a lot like polar bear hair. Well, we do have our first question, Miss Jane Ann. Oh, awesome. uh, our six-year-old friend, Cole, who's one of our avid viewers. Thank you so much, Cole. We look forward to your questions. Uh, the question is, what do they use their claws for? Polar bear claws are made sort of like fish hooks. They're short and they're, they're very sharp. And she uses those to sometimes excavate, to be able to dig down and find something, or she uses them to be able to pull or snag a seal or whatever she's get, trying to hunt to get a hold of that and hang on to it. Now, those claws are attached to some feet that are very wide and webbed, and they actually have a, an extensive amount of hair that grows in between their toes, so it starts to turn into like a snowshoe. So if it's super cold outside, she won't stick to the snow. You're gonna show a little bit of a claw, zoom in there for them. So we're talking about endangered species this week um, as our theme. So what makes Cunnick an endangered species? Cunnick, her, the numbers of polar bears are declining at a rapid pace, um, mostly because of the lack of reproduction. They need a lot of space. They don't live in family groups or in large groups. So one polar bear needs a tremendous amount of space and a tremendous amount of, of uh, hunting area to maintain itself and its family. Um, and so, yeah, when you start to lose your sea ice and you're losing your space that you live on and you hunt on, that causes a problem. Uh, so yes, habitat encroachment, loss of sea ice, not enough time to be out. And when they lose sea ice, that means they can't get out and they can't hunt. They have less time, less months of time. Not hours, but months. They have to hunt for several months to get that bulk up. And female polar bears will like double their body weight prior to going into a den. And so they need tons and tons of fat, tons of calories to, to bulk up and be able to maintain cubs and have cubs. 
So we've got a couple other good questions coming in. One is from um, Braxton, our friend, our eight-year-old friend Braxton, who's also one of our avid viewers. Thank you for your questions always. He, went, he or she wants to know what, uh, I'm sorry, how large their teeth are. Uh, polar, female polar bears tend to have uh, fairly large canines, but males are like twice the size of females. Their canines are about probably an inch and a half long. And then they, those are for grabbing and hanging on to, te to, to meat and to stuff. They have large grinding teeth that are carnivore teeth. They're all sharp. All of her teeth are sharp. She doesn't really have any grinding surfaces on her teeth. They all are cutting. So, yeah, if you get a big male, and a lot of that's, that's relevant to body size. If you got a great big bear, it'll have great big teeth. I have another question coming in from three-year-old Bennett who wants to know, do polar bears like water? Well, most polar bears do like water. This polar bear particularly likes water. Um, and they will have personal preferences depending on the time of year. She tends not to want to swim so much in the winter as much, but she will swim in the winter and she does spend a lot of time in the pool in the summer. And the pool's chill, so it feels really good, but she also has access to air conditioning too, so it's her preference on where she wants to hang out. Our friend Carol, who comes down to visit Cunnick a lot with Molly, her, our other friend, our polar bear friend, uh, she, her usual questions, how much is Cunnick weighing these days and what is she eating these days? She's in the 480s right now um, and she's getting lard and her meat and some polar bear kibble. Uh, she's she's decided that she does not like fish anymore ever again. We offer her a fish, but she's like, nah, I don't want that. So it's fluctuating. Right now she's on her way back up in her weight. So her diet will increase probably half a pound to a pound each week for the next several weeks. And then we'll, we'll plateau off again and she'll, she'll start backing off. She tells us how much she wants to eat. So we got a cool question coming in from eight year old Jack uh, and his mom, Dawn. Hi Dawn. Uh, how long would she have stayed with her mother in the wild? Typically polar bears and cubs hang out with mom till they're about two and a half. And at that, at that juncture, what happens is, is mom probably was bred again, and it's time for her to, to start putting on weight, and she can't share her resources anymore. And she's been bred, and so she needs to, to bulk up to den. And when it's time for her to have her ne next set of cubs, that's typically when they she runs them off, and she tells them to go get a job. So usually about two, two and a half. Switching just a little bit of gears here, uh, one of our guests wants to know, and this is a typical question that we've answered a lot this week, or during the past few months, have the animals noticed a difference uh, since there have been no, have we noticed a, a difference in the animals since there have been no visitors? I've noticed a difference in some of the animals, especially the primates, is when you show up, they're all about it. They wanna know what's going on. You know, somebody turned their, their uh, entertainment source off. They like to look at us just as much as we like to look at them. So don't think that they're not watching and paying attention to everything. So this is, this is kind of a change for them. Now, Cunnick, on the other hand, she chills. She, she doesn't really care. <laughs> she, she likes to see her certain people and she likes to hang out with people, but she likes the public in general. But if they're not here, she's a bear. She'll figure out something else to do. <laughs> uh, Three-year-old Bennett also wants to know, back to Cunnick, um, does she sleep a lot? Uh, she can. Being a top predator, they tend to be able to have the luxury of sleeping more and not having to be so vigilant to watch other uh, watch for other predators because they are on the top of the food chain. Um, so yeah, she'll take a good long nap. They typically sleep all night, but then she'll take a nap during the day as well. Got another question coming in from three-year-old Dotton, um, wanting to know why is she not swimming? There's a big pool behind her. She, she's choosing to hang out with us today. She has a choice. If she wants to go swim, she can. There's not uh, any reason for her to go swim right now. Can you talk about the rotation that exists in Glacier Run? And sure. Why? Um, we have grizzly bears here in Glacier Run as well. We have three of them. That's a mom and her two cubs that are now, they live singly now. They, uh, they got to that two and a half year mark and mom said, you need to go get a job. And so she, she made them go move on. But yes, we have the main exhibit where Cunnick's at right now. We have another exhibit called Bear Alley. And then we have a holding pen. And then we have uh, six stalls downstairs, six large bedrooms for the bears. And we will rotate them. They don't always come to the same place. They aren't always on exhibit for the same amount of time. 
they're not always next to the same bears. They can see each other. They can meet and greet through mesh. Um, so we move them around all the time. So they have tons and tons of space, tons of variety, lots of variability in their day, and, and gives them lots of enrichment. Here's a cool question coming in from Emma, who wants to know if they see in color. There's been a lot of uh, research done recently on animals and their color vision. And yes, it started, it's, it's believed that animals can see things in color. It just depends on the scale. So, you know, yellow can be very alarming to some animals. They tend to think that greens and blues are more calming, but there is a lot more research where it was for the, for a long time, it was thought that, that animals only saw in black and white or shades of gray. She, I was laughing because she kind of nodded her head yes when that yeah, question she's like, yeah, I don't know what's going on, man. I see a color. And uh, she does have a preference for toys. She picks different colored toys. One of her favorite things is a green ring. And she, she's had that green ring since she was about a year old. And it's still one of her favorite things to carry around and be with her. And she uses it as a pillow or she'll put it on her head and toss it and play with it. But it is one of her favorite toys. Well, from toys to uh, playmates, uh, we have a question from Janet. Is she going to get any company soon? As of right now, um, the limited number of polar bears that there are in managed systems, Cunnick is not slated to get a mate, so to speak, and Cunnick does belong to the federal government. And because she belongs to the federal government, we do not have the ability, we don't have the approval to have her reproduce. So as of right now, and polar bears are fairly solitary. They don't have to have a mate. They don't have to have another bear. So with our bears, the way it's set up, she does have some company if she chooses to. They don't have to interact with each other. They don't have to meet and greet at the mesh. But if they choose to, they can. But they also can get away from each other and stay in separate spaces and not even look at another bear. So that's yeah. A, that's a good uh, segue into talking a little bit more about her story and rehashing some of that for the people who are just joining us. U.S. Fish and Wildlife owned her, and can you tell us a little bit about her history again? Yes. Cunnick, Cunnick was found on the Cunnick oil field on the north slope of Alaska. Conoco Phillips oil folks spotted her on an oil field. They called Fish and Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife came, surveyed the area. They had, uh, like three or four weeks prior to seeing her, they had actually um, tranquilized her mother and they had ear tagged the cubs and had marked her mother. If you get a look at Cunnick in her left ear, sometimes you can see it, there's a hole in her ear and she did have an ear tag at one point. She had ear tags in both ears, but the left ear you can really see it. And it, during her recovery, it, it got a little infected so they removed the tag. But um, she came from the, she showed up, they came and took a look, couldn't find her mom and her sibling. And when they came back, she had disappeared again. Now remember, up there at the time that she was found, everything was white. So she was a tiny little thing when they first discovered her, she only weighed 17 pounds. So this is this little white fluff ball that disappeared in a white landscape. So of course you couldn't find her. Um, and she showed up about four days later, her toe inches, showed up about four days later and that's when the decision was made to, to bring her into uh, captivity and to bring her into a managed system and she moved to the, to the Alaska Zoo where they have lots of lots of experience raising pears and they got her back on the right track. And then ultimately the Glacier Run yes. because of our new exhibit and Jane Ann's experience. And Jane Ann, you kind of taught her how to swim, yeah? We did a couple of different things that were, I don't know if I taught her how to swim, but I taught her that it was okay to get in water. How about that? Um, we gave her some toys. We had the pool down to a, to a lower level. We at one point in time had somewhat of a false bottom in the pool, but she took it out. <laughs> So she was, she's pretty proficient in, from the get-go. But we tried to set it up to where she couldn't fail. Excellent. So Sebastian's just joining us. Maybe missed what her name meant and what her name is. So can you reiterate her name? Things? Her name is Cunnick, and that means snowflake in Inuit. The folks from Conoco uh, Phillips had named her and started calling her that, and that's the name of the oil field that she was recovered from. So we thought that it was fitting that she maintain that name. And it is quite fitting. She is quite a little snowflake. And the Inuit language is the native uh, language in Alaska, Sebastian, yes. for that. So um, let's see here. Braxton with another question wants to know if, uh, if the polar bear can smell that the grizzly bear has been living in its space and vice versa. Absolutely. 
These animals can smell, polar bears are known to be able to smell a seal under ice about four miles away. So their noses are, are a, a lot stronger than even the most talented bloodhound nose. And, you, and if you think about where they come from, that's quite advantageous for them to be able to smell from a long distance because there's not a lot around. There's not, it's very desolate. It's one of the harshest environments on the planet and they have to be able to locate prey and locate food now. Tiff, we missed your question earlier. You asked if we brought any uh, animals down to Glacier Run to visit with um, the bears like some of the other zoos have done. We've not done it at Glacier Run, but we are doing it um, tomorrow at Gorilla Forest. We're taking some small outreach animals to visit the gorillas. We've done that for the last three uh, Thursdays with uh, some of our primates. So you'll want to tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. on the Lift Up Global page. And we'll also be doing our watch party here uh, on, on our Facebook page as well. So, uh, But we haven't done that at Glacier Run just yet. Okay, so April, April's got a great question. Um, and, and most of the animals here at Glacier Run are rescued animals, but are all the animals rescued animals at Glacier No, Run? not all of them. Not all of them. All of our bears are. All of our bears, uh, the grizzly bears even came, they came from a place called Flathead Lake, Montana, and they were nuisance bears. Their mother had been, uh, had been caught three different times raiding chicken coops and pig pens. I think it was Rita was out in the alley and she's disappeared now. Mm -hmm. she, she wanted us to come over there and do something with her and we didn't and she left. <laughs> she said, I'll go find somebody else. She'll be back. Um, some of our pinnipeds are rescues and some of our pinnipeds were born in managed systems. We have one sea lion right now that came from uh, Malibu Beach in California. Sebastian missed your name. It's Kunnick Sebastian, Q-A-N-N-I-K, and it means snowflake in the Inuit Native Alaskan language. Uh, and Amelia, this is cool. Do, so grizzlies fish, do polar bears fish? Polar bears can fish, but for them, they don't have an opportunity to, like grizzly bears will eat salmon runs. Polar bears aren't around geographically. They don't find salmon runs. So for them to swim in the ocean and to catch fish, it costs almost more energy for them to catch the fish than, than it does for grizzly bears that are standing in a stream and they can eat the choice parts out of a salmon. And that's what happens. Once they really start getting their fill, they'll start eating the things that are the highest in protein. Um, typically the head, sometimes the belly, but they'll leave the rest of it when they start to get really full and they'll eat all that stuff to get really good and fat to go into hibernation mode. Hayden has a couple questions. First of all, Hayden, tomorrow we're going to be live at 11 a.m. Uh, on the Lift Up Global page and here at the Zoo's Facebook page at Gorilla Forest with some small outreach animals, visiting them to see uh, how they might interact and engage and, and see what enrichment is like for them. Um, she also wanted to know, he or she, I'm sorry, Hayden, uh, where's Kunnick from, just once again? Kunnick's from the North Slope of Alaska. She was found on the Kunnick oil field. That's how she got her name. She was rescued there um, 10 years ago. She's gonna be, she'll be 10 in January. She just turned nine this past January. It's hard to believe we're almost halfway through the year. I have a question, since we're talking about endangered species and um, our theme is that, and what one thing could we do at home to help the remnant wild polar bears? Uh, one thing we can do is we can turn our thermostats up two degrees for our air conditioning and turn it down a couple of degrees for our heat so that we are not leaving such a large carbon footprint. And that's called the two up, two down yep. challenge. Yep. Excellent. And you can, you can learn a, lo a little bit about that on our website or also Polar Bears International. You yes. want to talk a little bit about PBI? Polar Bears International is a, an important partner with us to help try to save polar bears and manage their environment. They do a lot of things. They have their ambassador program where folks from the zoo setting do go and, and they are go to Churchill, Canada, which is the polar bear capital of the world and experience polar bears firsthand and talk about the things we can do to, to make the planet better for polar bears and for the environment and how we're all connected and everything that you do, everything you do has an impact. And so even the smallest things, even though you think it's a small thing, all those small things add up to one big thing. So just recycling, taking care of your backyard, taking care of what you do at home will have a huge impact on, on the planet. Even turning your lights out, as simple as that. <laughs> well, we, may be, we may have to go find her in this exhibit here. Yeah. Guys, bear with us. 
Um, well, we do have a question about her plans to make, which we talked about earlier, if you want to reiterate that. Well, uh, Cunnick is, uh, belongs to uh, the Fish and Wildlife of the United States, and we have to apply for a permit to reproduce her. And as of right now, we cannot reproduce her. We don't have that approval. Um, oh, Thank you. There Connie. she is. Well, it thanks for she's coming by. <laughs> <laughs> she's ready to move on and do something else. Somebody <laughs> might be moving around downstairs. Something could be happening. You never know. She hears things we don't know. Um, but as of right now, we don't have the approval to to reproduce her. So we have another question coming about: um, Does she have friends she can interact with, etc.? Um, polar bears are fairly solitary, and so her interaction. She considers us, the humans, more of a group for her than, than, than the other bears, actually. But she does live here, and there are three grizzly bears that live in the same spaces and around the same place. So if she wants to hang out with a bear, she can. Um, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times she chooses to hang out with her people or to hang out by herself. Well, while we're waiting for her to come back in the photograph, here she comes. Um, Ada would like to know if polar bears uh, ever live in caves, like grizzlies sometimes or brown bears sometimes too. Um, polar bears typically don't have like a, uh, a home base or a home den. Typically what happens is, is polar bear moms, they're the only ones that hibernate and they will find a place that they would like to den and they might excavate it some but a lot of times they lay down and they start to snooze and the snow's on top of them and then they excavate some more and then they'll make a, a cubbing den and that's where they'll have their offspring and they won't they'll stay in there for about four months they won't come out at all until their cubs are ready to be taken out and start teaching them the ways of the world so they're totally dependent the cubs are totally dependent on their moms um, and mom doesn't eat anything and sometimes will lose up to 50 percent of their body weight during that denning time so braxton's got another good question wants to know and this is a good uh, conversation about how she does look yellow sometimes, and sometimes she's beautiful white. Um, how her coat, does it? Does she shed and she grow new fur? Yes, yeah, she sheds her coat annually. She blows out her winter coat, that big long coat. And right now she looks pretty white. By June, she'll be stark white. She'll be, have a longer, fluffier coat and she'll look really, really white. Then it'll start to change colors a bit and it'll start to look a yellow color um, when she's good and clean. She will go roll in the mud and make herself a muddy mess but it'll be, it'll start to get yellow. And that yellow color is from the oils in her skin. It helps keep her waterproof and it helps keep her hair waterproof because what happens is, is her hair is hollow and if it breaks off and water gets in there, it will grow algae in her hair. So, and that'll be inside. Now, I've seen that happen a couple of times with female polar bears that have cubs that are sitting down a lot and leaning back because they're nursing their cubs and they'll break their hair off on their back side and it'll turn green. It's it's really bad swimmer's hair. <laughs> so we're seeing a good uh, view of the exhibit here. Um, talk to us about what those glaciers represent and kind of the story behind Glacier Run a little bit. Glacier Run was developed as, um, as kind of a replica of Churchill and that's the polar bear capital of the world. These glaciers actually are absolutely correct in the way that they're shaped and formed and their coloration and you can see the wind lines in them and the the erosion at the top of them where the wind would have blown um, and glacier run is built exactly in the footprint of our old polar bear exhibit and actually on that back wall where the glacier is we maintain part of the old polar bear wall is in there so it is it is about a church it's about a town that's on the edge of uh, of wilderness and the town where bears and people would come in conflict with each other one exhibit is more naturalistic um, but it also exhibits where a glacier would wash out a road on one side and then the opposite side on the other side of the exhibit we have we have bear alley and it is uh, a replica of a of a loading dock so that's where bears, a lot of times they get into garbage, they get themselves into trouble doing things like that when they're really, really hungry and they think they can get a free meal. So that is one of the main places that people and bears would come in conflict. Well, we're about to wrap up today. Is there anything that you haven't said that you would like to remind people about? 
Well, just so you guys know that we're here doing what we do best, and we're here taking care of the animals, um, working our full days, working longer days actually, so we can be split into two teams and making sure these guys have what they need to maintain a healthy mental and physical state. Absolutely, you guys are doing an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for watching all of our Facebook Lives. Don't forget, we do this every day at two o'clock, except for Thursdays when we're at 11. Uh, we have our gorilla forest, uh, gorillas tomorrow with our some outreach animals to see about enrichment and see how they might engage with them. Uh, that's tomorrow at 11, also on our Facebook page at 11. And then two o'clock on Friday, we'll be back with uh, Fitz Friday, where we'll visit Fitz and Mickey up at the Elephant Yard. And then we'll do it all over next week. And next week's theme is Creepy Crawlies. So we're gonna give the reptiles and the herps some love. So we'll hope to see you then. Thanks again for Ford and T-Mobile, and we will talk to you guys soon. We miss you. Social distance, wash your hands, and we hope to see you soon. Safe and healthy.